Welcome to Lost in the Woods, a 15-day countdown to the worldwide release of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. In this series, I'm dissecting one game from the Zelda franchise every day with the goal of separating the core Zelda game elements from the fluff. I'll show you how Breath of the Wild is the culmination of 30 years worth of Nintendo defining, losing, rediscovering, and finally perfecting exactly what makes a Zelda game great. Nintendo needed to do something drastic to wrangle their franchise back in. The darker, gritty feel of Twilight Princess left a lot of people confused in the mirror opposite way that The Wind Waker had done previously. Nintendo needed to prove that their games were still accessible to the non-hardcore crowd and, you know, fun. They'd been experimenting with consoles for a more casual audience that got rid of buttons in lieu of touch or motion controls. So why not make a buttonless Zelda game to show the traditionally non-gamer crowd that Zelda games were worth their time? Because nearly every hater of the Wind Waker's kitty art direction had changed their story by this point in time, Nintendo decided that the same cel-shaded aesthetic could work pretty well. Yep, in a second knee-jerk reaction to distance themselves from the darker Twilight Princess, The Wind Waker 2 was born. As with every single Zelda game released previously, Phantom Hourglass was a lot of fun. It was fun to finally feel a continuation of the same characters, and it was great to revisit the uncomfortably massive overworld ocean. There isn't a lot of criticism about the game itself, considering it was marketed and developed for a more casual Zelda fan. It's cute, it's funny, and the relationship between Tetra and Link is worth experiencing. Yes, Phantom Hourglass was accessible. And its entirely forgettable sequel Spirit Tracks was even more accessible due to the removal of the freeform exploration of the ocean. It's only real connection these two games still had to the core non-linear experience. It was clear at this point, more than ever, that they believed their franchise was a great franchise because of the combat systems, the interesting items and abilities, the puzzly dungeons, and deep lore. Little did they know that they would soon learn that those are not the things that make a Zelda game great, those are the things that make a Zelda game fun. Want to know what events made Nintendo actually hit rock bottom? Come watch me dig into Skyward Sword tomorrow, where I lay the smack down. It's their final misstep before stumbling across the blessed core again, the long-forgotten and maligned discovery and adventure through non-linear exploration, the core to the formula that is giving us Breath of the Wild in just three short days. 